Okay, so um, let's begin. Um, good, uh, good evening to all of you. And uh, thank you so much for joining the session. Uh, so first of all, am I audible and you're able to see my screen? Paka, we're good to go. And uh, I'll also like make sure that uh, I allow you to unmute yourself, but then one small request is to not unmute yourself and disturb the flow. Um, otherwise I'll have to unmute everyone. So just for better interaction, kindly uh, mute yourself, but you'll be able to unmute yourself whenever there is an interaction required. Okay, so. Okay, so, um, so thank you so much for joining and I think, uh, you know, this is a very important session for all of us, um, uh, especially people who are in the teaching profession or in the field of education. This is a very, very important uh, policy that is going to govern uh, or rather going to impact the future. Not just our future, but the future generation as well. <clears throat> Though it has been launched like two months back, a lot of people have done their review. A lot of uh, reviews have been done on the national uh, education policy. But then I always felt that there was no yardstick for it to be measured, right? I mean, what do we look at, you know, look at the NEP against? There's no benchmarking. So I kind of did my research. I wanted to really go through, I really wanted to see like, you know, are we really solving the problem by uh, the national education policy? If at all we are solving a problem, what problems are we solving? And I looked for some global problems and I came across three major problems that that are actually, um, you know, uh, governing us. Uh, I forgot about my introduction, but you know, anyways, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I am Tamar Selvan Mahalingam. I am also part of Future Captains. I'm the CEO and founder of Future Captains. Future Captains is a edutech company which is primarily focusing on career education, um, and that was one of the reasons why I looked at NEP because career education is a primary. Uh, it's like the uh, the summit of a uh, mountain, right? You need to know where you're going to get. And career is a very important part of our life, 40 years. And um, I wanted to really see if the national education policy is really addressing the career education problem where students are clueless about what they wanted to do. And because of being that clueless, they make a lot of wrong decisions. And because of those wrong, wrong decisions, their career, get, uh, career, career gets impacted and because of which a lot of repercussions happen. Today, we look at girlfriend, boyfriend problem to buying mobile phones, houses, everything revolves around a job or a steady income. And the incomes comes through by building a proper career, right? And that was the reason why this was very intriguing. And that was one of the reasons why I took this up uh, as a study. I mean, um, I, I was like looking at the national education policy in a fragmented way, but then these three problems were the ones that really uh, lured me, right? And the problem is uh, large and beyond our imagination. I'll start with the quality of education, right? 2009, India participated along with 73 nations, they participated in a program that is organized by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. And this was a, uh, this, this entity actually runs a program called the Program for International Student Assessment, called the PISA, right, P-I-S-A. Now this PISA program is a global program and they do a standardized test for anybody who is age 15 years, right? And they want to see how the students are faring country to country. And unfortunately, Indian students fared 72nd in this amongst the 73 nations, right? Now that was the reason why India pulled out of this uh, PISA assessment for the last two times. This happens like every three years or so. And last uh, two uh, PISA assessments, India didn't participate and they're looking to participate in 2022, right? Now, my question is, what did we do differently from then to now? Nothing much. Our education curriculum or the standards, because the policy, at the policy level, nothing much has changed. Uh, you know, the national education policy, the previous draft was drafted like 30 years ago. And now we are looking at a new draft and I wanted to see whether it is addressing the, the numerical, uh, you know, uh, verbal and, uh, you know, STEM related or science related, literacy related, uh, you know, improvement uh, in, in, in the uh, new education policy. 
So that's one area where I was looking at. The second big problem that I was really was interested in the academic inflation. Now, this is a problem that all of us are seeing. In fact, our own children are uh, facing this problem. Um, if you observe closely, a lot of people will be doing post their UG. People think that UG is not enough. They need to do PG. All right. I'm sure all of you agree. UG is not enough. PG is required. And that's a myth. All right. A lot of times we come to believe that UG is not enough, but it's not so. And there is no scientific proof that your PG is correlated with the salary increment. There is no scientific proof for it. And that's all in the mind. And people think that once you get highly qualified and you get a higher salary, it need not be. And it, just, it doesn't happen. I'll show you uh, the proof for that as well. Now, what happens is once you think that plus two is not enough, I have to go to UG. That was like 30, 40 years ago, plus two was enough. Then they thought degree is good enough. Now degree is not good enough. They need post-graduation. Now post-graduation is not good enough. I have to do PhD. And this moving from one level to another is called academic inflation. We are inflating or rather we are actually looking at moving uh, uh, towards higher qualifications, thinking that they are going to get us better jobs. Now this also means that they are, we are going to face more people with higher qualification, which means we are our entry into corporate jobs will also be questioned or competed, right? And uh, another bigger problem is experienced people will now, uh, you know, people who have spent 20 years, 30 years in an organization, a fresher with a MPhil PhD will come and like automatically take your job, right? Because they'll be highly qualified than you. So that will become a problem for even experienced folks. So this is an academic inflation. And I was interested to see if the uh, national education policy tried to address this as well. Okay. And then underemployment. We have all heard about unemployment, but underemployment is a bigger problem. Something like our malaria. People don't talk about it. You know, unemployment is like our COVID-19. Everybody, you know, everything gets measured. And day in, day out, they will keep churning out statistics about unemployment, but nobody will talk about underemployment, all right? And uh, why underemployment is a bigger problem is a lot of people who would have gone for a higher education or highly qualified people, they will not be pursuing jobs that are matching with their education, all right? So if you look at the, uh, the graph on the right-hand side, right? The percentage of adults in the underemployment, underemployed by age is actually very high in the 20 to 29 age uh, group. This is 2008. I am very sure this will be much worse today, right? Now we know that engineers are working for Swiggy and things like that, delivering packages. This only says that our, uh, you know, the underemployment percentage would have gone to a very high level that uh, people don't want to measure it because that will actually topple governments as well so you know so underemployment so i just wanted to see whether the national education policy is addressing these things right now before i start right i wanted to ask you did you go through the nep what was your thoughts or your experience or your impression of the uh, you know the national education policy what did you feel about the national education policy you can unmute yourself and speak Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. I am Sreel Kumar from Rensselaer School, Bulai Shahar. And yeah. sir, uh, in my view, in my opinion, education policy is uh, very good, and uh, it has uh, framed our education uh, as it was earlier in India, as it was implemented in olden universities, Takshila and Nalanda, and uh, that is a little bit of that form, sir, according to me. As far uh, as far as uh, I have just observed the uh, different uh, uh, themes that we participated in uh, national policy uh, competition provided right. by government, uh, then sir, we uh, learned a lot about that. Uh, uh, definitely, not only uh, the education of a child is important when he is studying, starting from one uh, class one, it is important uh, from. Uh, that class earlier also means uh, after he has got his education matters a lot and his surroundings also impact his future. That's it, sir. Right. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, you. sir. This is yeah. Sharmila Soman. Yes, I'm the principal of AKG Public School. Just yes, to sum it up, I just wanted to say it in a couple of words. It's very holistic and very futuristic. And I think that's the need of the hour because okay. we, are le we are going into an unknown future and uh, we're not sure whether the children know what they are, uh, what they will be doing 10 years hence. So I right. think uh, it takes care of that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay, so I will start with the school education. So I'm, just, I'm not going to get into the teacher. Um, you know, there were four segments. One is the teacher development and governance. Uh, I've tried to include the teacher, uh, you know, training part as part of my uh, session, but not the governance part. I've not spent too much of time on that because, uh, you know, that's more for the policymakers at, at a governance level. Uh, but happy to answer any questions and I will try to answer that at a later stage. So you will see two parts. One is the school education and higher education. That's what we are going to focus on. And finally, I will talk about my verdict and what I see as positives and uh, negatives as part of the national education policy. Uh, it's very important to, uh, uh, you know, before we start off, right, we have to understand that India is a, a, a boiling pot of different types of cultures, right? And uh, the sentiments are very different from uh, region to region. Uh, there are a lot of the regional diversity and that's something that we all celebrate, right? And one thing that we need to keep in mind is the national education policy, is it really looking at uh, a country, uh, you know, with that regional or rather the diversity optic is something that we all need to be a little mindful about. Uh, that's uh, on that note, on that uh, preamble, uh, I will walk you through. Uh, the slides will be a little verbose, so please excuse me, it might get a little boring. Um, what I will do is I will try to highlight one point per slide and rest you can read up, um, you know, so that we will save time and we will also make sure that it is more engaging, right? So, so we'll start with this. So school structure right and i was very really interested to see that you know they came up with the uh, the you know what, what do i say the, the foundational preparatory middle and secondary uh, model which is actually a very interesting model and this model is not new right and this is already done in cambridge and cambridge has a very similar model the igcse curriculum right and this emulating the structure was something that i really liked and uh, this is something that i truly uh, understand because uh, we need to have a very different uh, structure because the the cognitive ability of children has definitely changed. They have a lot more intelligence than before, a lot more access to digital, um, you know, materials, and they they live in a very different world. So we need to understand how do we treat them, and the old ways of doing things uh, might not be really applicable everywhere. So we need to really um, reimagine the way we are teaching our children right from the foundational level to the secondary level. So that's something that I really liked. And uh, the model of uh, emulating this uh, entire structure with on par with the IGCSE is something that is welcoming. Um, I don't see anything wrong in copying. That is something that is really working, right? Now, coming to this, um, you know, the first uh, point of, you know, the, 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 there'll be many highlight slides, but I will uh, walk you through some of the key things, right? The one thing that came out very uh, important for me is to involve community and alumni in volunteering and efforts in enhancing learning, right? So this means uh, the alumni should come back to the schools and we are not talking about our elite schools. We are talking about schools at the grassroots level, the primary, uh, the secondary schools, the government schools, the, 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 um, the Balwadi groups, Anganwadi groups, so uh, uh, schools. So we are looking at uh, you know, uh, those kind of schools need some kind of people uh, from, you know, community support and alumni uh, volunteering support that will actually improve the quality of learners, right, and uh, learning as well. And another important point that I really liked was constructing girls' hostels. And this is something that is very strategic. And I, I thought it was a visionary move, right? It was a master stroke. If you construct girls' hostels and a lot of girls from the remote villages can come to uh, accessible places, stay in the hostels and study, right? And at a low cost. And that was a very, very important move in improving GER. And GER, they want to be 100% uh, at, at least at a primary level by uh, 2030, which is, uh, I think is a very ambitious move. 
uh, but not uh, something that cannot be done. Uh, you know, we have many role models, including the state of Tamil Nadu. We have already um, gotten to 50%, near 50% uh, GER. But uh, that is something that was a masterstroke for me, right? The next important point that I felt was, uh, you know, including sports, because if you look at sports as a, uh, a discipline, um, a lot of times I felt sports take the backseat. A lot of students, we talk about this uh, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, musical intelligence and, uh, you know, uh, mathematical intelligence, uh, spatial intelligence. There are many types of intelligence. And most of the time, India, uh, Indians, we think mathematics is the only in mark of intelligence, right? And that has to go away. And I felt <clears throat> the sports integration uh, is a very important move. And uh, that will also increase our inflow into sports, uh, you know, discipline, sports streams. And for many of you, if you don't know, sports management or sports related careers are many. Right. And that was something that I really loved as a career education company. I really wanted to see something like that. That uh, was as part of the agenda. So that was good. And uh, not really having a separation among curricular or extracurricular. Now, uh, people say music as extracurricular, right? Drawing as extracurricular. Now, the mind shift of taking that separation was very important. The way in which we need to see arts as, as even physics. Uh, uh, music uh, uh, on par with medicine, you know, they are also careers. They also uh, can be pursued as uh, academic or uh, vocational stream. Now, that was very important. I really love that point that that mind shift came into uh, our education policy, right? And a semester-based system, uh, exit point. So anytime after 10th, they can exit, they can move into vocational stream or academic stream. Those flexibilities, uh, was something that was uh, truly, truly welcoming. And I really loved uh, the way it was thought through, right? I, I mean, I truly appreciate that entire panel who came together and came up with such a thought, okay? And uh, very importantly, the language part, I'll, I'll touch upon the language in multiple places. Uh, one area where I really liked is to say, for example, somebody in UP studying Tamil, and I come from Chennai, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm a Tamilian by birth, uh, but if somebody from UP, UP schools start teaching Tamil. So teachers from Chennai moving to uh, uh, UP or, or any other part of the country to teach Tamil to the local students. So there is this cross-cultural, the cross-pollination of culture, languages, so that the, the disparity or the kind of bias that we carry can be brought down. And I think that was something, uh, you know, again, a very important move. Uh, but again, uh, there might be some political... Uh, you know, moves to stop these kind of arrangements. But then I think the, for the, the thought of bringing such an exchange was very welcome. And um, we wanted to see that, uh, you know, the three language formula, right? And uh, I think there's a lot of debate that's happening. One thing I can tell you very clearly, nowhere, uh, you know, you can see Hindi imposition in this policy. I can tell you that. And if anybody who's listening to this, uh, yeah, you know, I can even challenge you that there's no way that nowhere that they are imposing Hindi or uh, you know to on any other state. It is very clear you have three languages where two languages can be Indian language and third can be any other language. It could be a foreign language too, like Japanese, German, and um, so uh, that is something that is uh, you know I think a lot of uh, uh, wrong information is being floating, and it's also one of the trigger points for me to actually go back and see. Is there anything really like that? And who, you know, what kind of a person will actually uh, put such a statement of, you know, one Hindi should be studied, uh, especially in a country like India, where India is a very free country, right? We are, we are all very free, and we don't live in a countries where there are strong rules are imposed. And, uh, and and in a country like us, uh, I think this is a very well, welcoming move, and we should all learn uh, other languages in India. And I am very open for that, and we should all learn the language, different languages of our country so that we can do businesses with other parts of the country so that we can have a free flow and stop really playing to, uh, you know, a very fanatic mindset is something that I think this will change um, that kind of a, a approach. And um, another very interesting is classical languages. And India has some uh, four or five classical languages, including Sanskrit, Tamil, Kannada, Telugu, uh, etc. So 
now these classical languages uh, are also you know they are saying that they will want to teach students on these uh, classical languages um, in from grade 6 to 11 and depending on whether the student is interested right and um, now coming to uh, you know i think from a pedagogy and the way in which uh, language uh, or or even the students will be treated i think that was something that uh, you know i really like now coming to the uh, assessment part another very intriguing uh, interesting part that that came up was the way they they want to assess the students right they want to come up with a tracking mechanism using artificial intelligence where they could track the students progress year on year right and that was something that i really liked and uh, they were they are also looking at a national testing agency um, so in my view or rather i might be wrong but then what i'm thinking is maybe very soon the iit neat entrance exams will be eliminated and there will be something else that will take up its place like what we have in um, in the us they have sat and toefl right likewise we will have something else in india which will be a common test across india and for both medical and uh, engineering admissions so that's something that uh, you know i do, i do see that as a very good opportunity for all of us and um, one uh, another thing is the um, you know credit management or how you are tracking the student now ai tracking if it's really implemented they are also looking at uh, you know uh, all these you know olympiad scores and things like that are considered for iits nit admissions and i think if if they implement such a thing it will be beautiful it will be truly beautiful because uh, the demonstration of skill or the aptitude is also taken into consideration it's not just the mark that we get out of uh, a, an entrance exam but also holistically what kind of a person you are and the leadership capability so that your marks plus your demonstration of leadership or uh, talent is also taken as an additional valuation to admit you into prime premier institutions i think that will be a great move to see now um, with respect to teachers um, a lot of times uh, i have seen i mean uh, i might be wrong but personally when i am interacting with teachers a lot of people i feel that they are overworked because they they are not really coming into teaching as a profession without knowing what they are getting into all right there is this sense of giving back to children or they want to take this up as a career because they they can buy more time or they can have a easy life but the reality is very far from that and a lot of people get stuck in these teaching careers and this is something that i've been seeing uh, time and again and one thing that the new education policy is trying to come up with is promoting teaching as a profession because even if i go to students and ask them what they want to do most of them end up with medicine engineering law ca etc but nobody says teaching or agriculture or defense right especially southern states now that being the case i think uh, students i mean especially uh, luring outstanding students to you know into teaching profession that will be a great move especially for rural areas and also teacher eligibility test yeah, yeah. i think uh, i think can you go on mute um, with so um sorry did i miss it yeah so teacher eligibility tests uh, another very interesting area where um, you know teachers will be uh, tested and um, they will be uh, continuously tested they will be evaluated to for for improvement as well as um, you know uh, or rather track you know uh, moving them to different career paths right and a very interesting uh, thing that they have also spoken about is you know training school Uh, leadership um, i think that was one big miss in our education system there is no framework there is no um, qualification criteria for somebody to become a chancellor or a principal you know there I, i don't see there is any governance there right and i think that is will something if they bring that into uh, full force i think that will be a great thing right and and um, that uh, being said uh, we are also seeing that they have a provision for training uh, middle and secondary school teachers in special education so you know you cannot have every person turning into a special educator so the reverse is to train teachers the existing general teachers into special education um, that's again a master stroke in my personal view right um, that's one 
Now, what I really want to uh, question is, um, you know, especially from the school um, education system, is that they want to develop holistic uh, learners, but then there is nowhere that they have mentioned how they are going to develop the content are the teachers. There's no clear action plan. Um, so when you don't see an action plan, it looks very uh, great on paper, right? It's like the difference between reading the book and watching it, watching the same story on a movie screen. Uh, there are two different things, uh, right? And implementation becomes the key here and for, for which I don't see a clear action plan. And uh, now, uh, you know, even when it comes to knowledge systems, they are talking about ancient knowledge. They speak more about Sanskrit and mind you, Sanskrit appears 23 times in our NEP, right? And uh, I appreciate that where they are coming from. But I also want to understand what about other knowledge system? Every other classical language has a knowledge system, right? And that's never spoken about. And which again gives me that very, uh, you know, itchy feeling that, you know, what makes them think that science is the only knowledge system? And there are other knowledge systems that's been less explored. Now, for example, let's take Pali. Pali is a language, not many people speak that, right? And uh, it's, it's gone out of, uh, what do you say, it's, it's nearly dead. Now, bringing that language back into life is very important, right? And there are many dead languages, very few people speak. And bringing that back is also very important. And I don't see, you know, enough amount of importance given to such languages, okay? And uh, talking about Panchatantra, Jataka, Hito Pradesh, uh, again, Vedic literature, uh, I appreciate where they are coming from. But again, my question is, why not a text like Tirupur? And it's, why, is translated in hundreds of languages across the globe. My question immediately that came up in my mind is why not the it's, it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a book of code and ethics. Um, but again, uh, that's a question that uh, that I'm just throwing out in the open. That that came to my mind. Uh, so these were something that I, I couldn't really find answers, and there's no um, you know I couldn't really uh, wrap my head around and see um, you know why they didn't think about these things, right? So that's what. Now coming to higher education, um, uh, anybody, uh, uh, you know, I'm just asking uh, to the, uh, you know, participants, any views on the higher education part? Uh, have you gone through the higher education side? Um, and uh, did you see anything that really you liked or you didn't like? Any, any pointers that you faced? Can you share your views, please? Higher education here, we are talking about university college. Yeah, I know. Um, Good evening, sir. The multidisciplinary part was very good. Yes, you're right. Okay. okay. It's a flexible way of learning. All right. You're right. Uh, and uh, giving, uh, you know, uh, the degree and diploma after every mm. year, that is also uh, very good. Like uh, they right. need not complete uh, full four years if they are not in a position to complete. And even after completion of the first year, they, they'll be given one certificate and second year another certificate. So it's going to help them to shift uh, to the subject of their own interest. So this right. uh, really, I liked it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else? Um... Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Good evening, sir. Actually, in that uh, new education policy, I uh, I like this uh, three language formula. Actually, I mean, uh, expected to bring it compulsory even in uh, all the schools. Sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that uh, that thing because already uh, many government st government school studying students are uh, um, they are not having the opportunity of uh, learning other than two languages. Right. If it uh, comes uh, in, if it uh, becomes inculcated in all the schools means uh, it will be a good opportunity I think so I like that particular part uh, in our uh, education policy sir. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Higher education anything in particular in higher education college education? Um, okay. Okay. So um, I'll share my thoughts. Okay. Uh, giving uh, one thing for research sir. Lot of importance is being given to research. Precisely. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That and was also something that came they, very. That is really good, and uh, you know, doing research uh, and selecting the research uh, scholars based on merit. So that part right. I like. Thank right. you. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, 
these are the uh, some of the things that they have tried to fix is that you know um, the previous uh, i think the current higher education institution management itself let it be your aict or ugc the entire model is very confusing right and the way in which uh, you know the government the, the the committee itself viewing is it has to go away and something else better than that should take take over its place right the ugc and aict now that means there's a lot of drastic changes that we need to bring in and that has to happen at every level so more than the school uh, you know uh, education the more challenges will be in the higher education system because there is a lot more uh, you know complexity and uh, because it directly pushes them to jobs right and it's just the last mile between the, the you know the person and the career the the, the world right and uh, getting them life ready and using this word life ready is something that is i mean we work with many colleges we even find the students can't even understand the statement right we and a lot of times we see uh, students are not able to follow a simple instruction um, these are all very bad for the society and imagine this a uh, uh, well educated uh, student who is applying all his knowledge in the wrong area right and that's the kind of youngsters we have got today most of them right and uh, that's something that is really going to be a, a nightmare for all of us because we think it's somebody else's child somebody else's um, a boy or girl but any time soon it will hit our homes as well so uh, you know it's not somebody else's problem all of us have to be collectively uh, you know waking up to the fact that we are screwing up the next generation's uh, mindset completely and we are we are equally responsible for that now that is something that where uh, they have tried to fix by you know coming up with a model where uh, developing the uh, youngsters holistically not you know not just from academic standpoint but for, from also from a cognitive uh, soft skills uh, uh, person right and giving them the flexibility to study what they want so the liberal arts kind of uh, setup is something that they are looking at uh, at every uh, every stage right and better governance in higher education institutions is also something that they are looking at and uh, so these are some of the areas uh, you know the lacunas that they are trying to fix and i'll i'll walk you through some of the highlights uh, you know for a better understanding right now if you look at the gross enrollment ratio is currently around 26.3 uh, especially from a uh, uh, students who are moving into vocational or higher education uh, uh, especially the undergraduate um, segment now they want to move it to 50% by 2035 i think that will happen that will eventually happen i think i won't see any challenge in this ger increasing only difficulty is there will be more dropouts and we are already seeing the advent of dropouts in higher education institutions especially students with higher number of arrears right um, there is this startling uh, aict um, um, uh, report that came out i think 2 years back where about fewer about 20 to 30 percent of institutions have actually engineering institutions have actually have higher pass pass percentage the rest all have a pathetic uh, you know uh, clearance ratio so that means um, we will have a bigger issues not just the gross enrollment ratio but people won't academically complete their courses i think uh, uh, as ma'am said uh, the degree diploma certificate model is good but um, i think this will also become an excuse for people to not really paying attention to completing the course um, this could be this could have a, a downside to it so we need to have a proper governance in place otherwise that might go for a toss and people might use that to their uh, advantage um, on the other hand um, you know we are also looking at uh, consolidating uh, industry uh, universities right so many colleges will become universities they will bring three or four colleges together convert that into a multidisciplinary university so that is also something that uh, the national education policy is recommending um now looking at uh, this multidisciplinary thing right and um, the multidisciplinary view or the thinking itself is great and i personally feel that education should be multidisciplinary and we started advocating multidisciplinary learning 2 years back and you know uh, even now people are not waking up to the fact even engineering institutions or even arts and science law colleges people are not waking up to the fact that they need uh, you know uh, understanding of different areas different verticals different industries 
it's not happening right so what they are saying is uh, we need to bring a combination of mathematics science vocational subjects professional subjects soft skills um, you know together i like mr surender said uh, they want to go back to the old ways the nalanda takshashila kind of uh, uh, setup where uh, we bring uh, all these subjects together for a holistic learning and i truly welcome that and i i personally like the way uh, because that gives a flexibility to the student and also a lot of permutations and combinations so i can customize my learning and i can choose a career path that i want um what what was something that was really not convincing is um how the flow will happen right and because the credits have to be managed and they have to store it so they have tried to answer that uh, question uh, and i will i will show um uh, you know in a, in a, in the in the coming upcoming slide now coming to the degree certificate and diploma combination all right um, a lot of times i personally feel the student dropouts uh, you know once they finish first year and they drop out um, you know because they don't like the course there's a lot of flexibility there so my one year is not wasted so i can actually take i just clear my exams i come out with a certificate and i move into a different full time degree so i don't have to spend 4 years wasting my time in a degree that i really don't like so that is beautiful but only thing is that it should not be misused uh, because our people always look for hacking hacking the system right anything that is done with a good intention always gets hacked so and people try to you know abuse that system so you you get one uh, you know how these diplomas will flow into the next degree or higher education do they have to do another four year degree or do they have to do another three year degree to complete that uh, degree completely is something that is not clearly mentioned so there is no uh, a system or a clear recommendation there it seems to be like a vision uh, an idea on the paper but nothing really um, strong enough to see through uh, for implementation yanga enter edunna okay ishma ma'am is unmuted okay so and and another thing that they are also looking at is uh, bringing international students to india now this question um, this point was like little uh, you know i don't know i was not really sure now if international students come to india uh, i personally feel that most of the teachers especially down south uh, uh, the engineering institution teachers are not really motivated in teaching itself and and i personally feel that if we have to bring international students into india uh, there's a lot of uh, you know work that has to go, go into developing our uh, teaching faculty and uh, it's not just about transfer credits moving here and there we need to have truly knowledgeable people and hands on people who can teach and that's where um, i personally feel there'll be a lot of hard work so if we are looking at growing our institution to international level it means we have to up the teaching uh, quality or teacher quality and we need to bring the right kind of people into teaching profession and that will uh, take a mammoth effort right so they are also looking at um, you know uh, converting teaching uh, teacher education institutions to become multidisciplinary um, which i again a uh, very welcoming change because uh, i personally feel that it's not just about how to teach and how pedagogy teaching instrument bloom's taxonomy is not just that it, you should also have subject knowledge and you should have multidisciplinary knowledge and including uh, special education and talking about that i think teachers have to be holistically developed and i personally feel that the the post pandemic world will rely heavily not on doctors not on lawyers not on engineers but teachers who make the mark right and that's very very important so if you are demotivated uh, of your profession if you are a teacher if you really hate your job you don't like the way you're going through things um i think the golden period for teachers are coming up right and um, if you are not prepared to see this future uh, most likely you you won't really survive this wave and we all get a wave to right right it had a way um, today healthcare is having a way you know like that teachers will have a wave now even you have that wave uh, and if you want to ride that wave and you want to move to prosperity i think 
our mind shift has to move towards um, improving our skills as teachers and our thought process and understanding of the student community children have also to change and um, in fact something that we do as part of future captains is to train uh, teachers on career education especially the career counseling part in fact even uh, help them understand how psychometrics are, are done and these things are something that we um, you know uh, we want teachers to participate with us partner with us in taking these kind of the next level um, uh, what do you say preparatory tools to the student community so if at all i'm just throwing this word because i want you to uh, think about this uh, we want people we want teachers to work very closely with us um, in 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 reaching out to students to making them future ready and we also want to work with teachers to make them future ready and that's something that uh, you know we are already working on so i'm very happy that the national education policy is also looking at uh, uh, doing that for teachers and i'm i'm happy that we we, we are kind of working on the same area right and um, the another mandate is to have phd students so fresh phd students to actually start working uh, would start teaching um, you know to students and i think that mandate is very important they've also done with uh, you know mphil they're not mphil will be um, decommissioned so which is a good thing right uh, they, you don't need that unnecessary step and talking about academic inflation now they are making it even more easier to pursue your phd right and the second point is my favorite of all the points that i have seen this is my favorite because this is very close to my heart so bringing back senior or retired faculty to mentor students what beautiful thought that is right and i i personally feel that you know that will be that will be a huge uh, change um, you know that will also give you a lot of support especially young teachers uh, you know who are moving into profession and having a senior teacher to guide them in in teaching and and how to live uh, the life of a teacher and that that's a beautiful thought all right and um, another very interesting thing is the um, vocational education right and uh, personally speaking vocational education the iti's diplomas have always seen as something that is um, not something that people are proud, proud about and i think that mindset has to change vocational education like carpentry plumbing electricians why not what's wrong in that that dignity of labor has to come in i think that uh, is also something that uh, people have a uh, thought through they are giving more uh, in, you know importance to vocational education as well i was just check, checking my time and um, i'm just uh, uh, coming to the last uh, you know part uh, the regulatory system is changing so uh, especially in the higher education part so they are looking at having a higher education commission of india um under that they will have four pillars which is the national higher education regulatory council national accreditation council higher education grants council and general education council and these four councils will actually take care of the uh, curriculum the compliances the teaching methodology and the skill framework for you know uh, basically uh, grading students so uh, i think these four pillars will become uh, the key bodies i think they will slowly uh decommission uh, bodies like aict etc uh, and this will take over its place and uh, i am actually looking forward to this change and uh, another very interesting um uh, move, move is to uh, change these uh, you know the top bodies like icmr indian council for medical research or veterinary council of india whatever ncat all these things moving into professional standards setting so they become body of knowledge where they'll set the standards uh, rather than just a uh, you know uh, 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 you know a, a body which just comes when there is a trouble right um, so they will start setting standards for courses professions um, uh, you know certifications licenses so that's what they are getting at and another uh, interesting uh, point is curbing commercialization of education i'm not sure if that will get implemented uh, it looked very um, and impractical uh, for me because politicians run an education institution to stop it and commercialization um, I, again i don't know how that could be uh, curbed but uh, i think the thought process of having ceilings uh, in terms of uh, fees uh, i think it's it makes a lot of um, difference i personally feel that uh, you know uh, they should actually look at uh, you know having some kind of 
fees, uh, you know, structure for institutions so that a lot of people, it can, it can get democratic, right? And a lot of people can have access to quality education. And, um, and finally, professional education, they're looking at, uh, looking at uh, governing agriculture, education, healthcare. When it comes to healthcare, like looking at uh, promoting Ayush, and that's a big welcoming move for me because uh, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, we saw the student suicides recently. Um, those who didn't complete, you know, they couldn't uh, really appear for neat exams. Uh, you know, they have committed suicide. I think healthcare is not just about MBBS. It's about doing Ayurveda or Yunani or yoga or Siddha. You know, there's so many other areas. And I think the Indian tradition medicine can also be promoted. Uh, in my personal view, I think that's been uh, something that's part of the agenda and I really like uh, what they've done for this. So I've come to the last part, the, uh, the, uh, the verdict part. So what I personally feel that they have really done well is a lot of emphasis is given to, um, uh, you know, uh, holistic development, all right? And um, from primary year to PhD, uh, research is given a lot of importance. Um, language, uh, especially the two Indian languages, a welcome move, uh, better governance models. And I personally feel that they have tried to you know, address all the malignancies in our education system holistically. Um, and um, I think the intentions have been pretty good uh, in my personal view. Uh, a good time for language teachers, because I think if you are going to be a language teacher, you'll have a lot more opportunities in the upcoming years. So if you love language, you should look at becoming a language teacher. And um, special educators are also, they see a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, role, especially in schools. And psychologists, they are also, under, you know, they are also mindful that uh, students are into, you know, higher stress levels. They need some, um, you know, psychological support. So in-house career counselors or in-house psychological counselors, uh, psychiatric counselors are important. Um, and uh, I think that will also be a good move. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people can pursue psychology and, uh, and teaching as a profession in the coming years. So th that's a well done part. What could have done better? Uh, what could they, what they, they could have done better is um, there's no talk about placement and career education at all. And I don't know why. Ultimately, people have to get into jobs and not everybody can become an entrepreneur, right? We're looking at a uh, very uh, abysmally low number who will become an entrepreneur. And uh, that is something that I was not very comfortable. And Sanskrit getting too much of attention. 23 times it's mentioned, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's mentioned in the document as if it's the only connected with India's past. And I was really not comfortable. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. But then uh, there are other languages. Uh, I'm bringing up Pali or Kannada or Telugu, uh, you know, that is something that I was not very comfortable. Um, inclusivity and diversity, uh, again, hovered around disability and transgender, uh, again, was missed. Uh, I, di I didn't really see uh, mentioning of transgender, LGBTQ uh, segment. Um, I really didn't see, um, you know, um, how much of reservation we can give to teachers from a transgender, right? Like women, uh, girls getting hostels, uh, we need to actually even cater to transgender children as well. And we know they are in uh, abundant numbers and uh, uh, LGBTQ is, should also be something that we need to be very mindful. We can't just brush it under the carpet and say that there's nothing like that in our country. Absolutely uh, rubbish. And religious and regional diversity has been completely omitted. Um, I think that is something that I was pretty, pretty disappointed. And how are they going to look at uh, the religious diversity? Anybody going through the document uh, and, and they might feel that they are, they are not really considered as part of the education policy. And uh, I think they could have avoided that uh, thought process. Sex education, uh, completely missed out. There's no single word called sex in that entire document. I don't know uh, if that is a taboo. Uh, we, we are looking at a uh, uh, world where pornography is easily accessible to everybody. And uh, we are sitting on a time bomb and girls and boys have access to such material no matter how much ever we trying to curb it, people will have access to mobile phones and such content. If we don't educate them on sex, sex and sexuality, that's another big problem that we will face. And uh, I think uh, they have not really paid attention to that. And uh, the last point is entrepreneurship. 
doesn't really figure in the agenda. And I personally feel um, if you are going to create employees or you know workers, is that what our curriculum is all about? When you're talking about holistic, then leadership or entrepreneurship is, is important and we need people to create jobs. We are going to look at vocational courses. There should be a clear pathway and setting up of you know um, hubs and entrepreneurial, uh, we can say e-cell in colleges, but we all know how it is operating, right? And how many innovations, product innovations have come from these e-cells? How many mainstream products have come? You know, I, I don't have a clue. I mean, if you have an example, you can mention it. But that is something that, I, you know, I personally feel that entrepreneurship has not really been, uh, uh, you know, paid attention to. Um, I think uh, there's too much of uh, focus on Sanskrit and culture, but miss, missing out on diversity, sex education and entrepreneurship, career education, very important, which my cup of tea, I'm really upset that they didn't talk about career education, where most of the children are making wrong choices in their uh, 11th group selection or in, in college degree selection. I'm sure as teachers, you know, especially those who are handling uh, undergraduation courses, you know that most of the students whom we are facing don't even, should not even be there, right? And they are there. And uh, that's again, they are, uh, it's somebody else's seat that they have taken up. And that kind of a, uh, equity uh, or rather uh, uh, inequality is something that we need to really curb. And um, I personally feel that uh, they have missed out on uh, doing a good job in these areas. But all said, uh, I think the intentions have been good. And uh, I, I still uh, am positive about it, but not really completely satisfied. Okay, so my major verdict is um, the education quality part. If you look at my first slide, uh, the education quality and the academic inflation and underemployment. Um, when I'm looking at that, education quality is definitely taking care. They're looking at holistic, they're looking at um, flexibility, they're looking at uh, multidisciplinary learning, they are addressing teacher, uh, teachers, they are addressing uh, governance, they are addressing uh, facilities, everything is taken care. So I'm sure uh, if the policy really gets implemented, the education quality will uh, uh, go up. Um, wherein um, academic inflation, I think uh, if you get into that certificate diploma uh, degree option, I think academic inflation will also get controlled. And so people will know exactly what they need to do and different interventions. And we are really thick because um, uh, as a career educator or career guidance organization, um, we could actually help more people because once they finish a certificate, they could come to us and uh, understand uh, what next, uh, you know, after their certification, right? So I see a better role uh, in, in that area. So um, I'm really happy uh, about uh, the way the academic inflation part is being handled, but, the underemployed underemployment issue is still not addressed. Why I'm saying that is uh, a lot of students will study, they'll come out, they'll be flexible in, in getting uh, the certificate or whatever it is. But when they get out, if they don't have jobs, they don't know uh, whether they will start a business and there's nowhere that entrepreneurial education is part of the system. And uh, I think that part will continue to be there. And just as I said, underemployment is a, invisible uh, demon that all of us are uh, uh, going to face. Um, I think uh, I'm probably the only person who's speaking about it. Nobody else I've seen. I've seen, I've seen so many people I've, I've searched on the internet. Nobody really talks about underemployment, right? Everybody comes up with unemployment as figures, but the real problem is underemployment. It's not been addressed. And um, as I told you, uh, career education, value skills, or entrepreneurship and sex education, grossly ignored and um, I personally feel that it's a, it had a great opening. It had good intentions, but I'm not really um, happy with the way uh, it's, it's truly not really holistic. So that is what my final verdict is. And thank you so much um, for patiently listening to my um, you know, session. And there's a feedback a form, please go ahead and give your feedback and we will send you e certificates um, so that you can you know you can you you can definitely take it up and uh, any questions any thoughts please um, uh, you know you can unmute yourself and speak and we can have a dialogue uh, it should not be just a one way um, session
Uh, sir, I have uh, one important point to discuss uh, here yes, in this session. It, this is regarding TET teacher eligibility test. Uh, yes, that should be made as the, uh, the compulsory mandatory qualification for any teacher, whether she or he is a college teacher or a school teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, TET uh, should be made compulsory uh, for college, you know, as you have this net slit and all for college. Uh, in schools, uh, you know, whether it is a management school or a government school or a private school, whatever it is, you know, that should be made compulsory. Uh, uh, it, this is my personal opinion. And also, uh, the salary of teachers should be fixed, in the, especially in the management schools, by the government. As the government fixes the fees right. for the students, for the right. private schools, the management schools, Teach the salary should also be fixed by the government because some schools pay very, very, very less salary, very low salary. So the teachers are demotivated. Uh, so because they lose their interest uh, right. for working for a less salary, the output is very low. So you can't simply blame the teachers and, uh, you know, and, uh, government has to intervene and uh, they must... Uh, you know, carry out a research or something, you know, like that in all the management. Yeah, uh, actually, excellent point. It has I to think, be done. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a very, uh, very beautiful point that you have raised, actually. Because I think some representation from the teacher side should go. Just like how we have licensing for medical or legal professionals, uh -huh. there should be some kind of a licensing for teachers as well, right? Uh -huh. So also, that's the standardization, some, yeah. some kind of a standardization, standardization can happen. Okay. And uh, we can have quality people who can pass through that qualification can mm. become teachers and the sal salaries can be fixed. Uh, so yeah. it could be a governance body. So true, sir. Yeah. And also yeah. it is not uh, you know enough if we just bring in uh, the new or national education policy and all that. But how we implement it, that is very, very important. And how much of importance is being given to the teachers. Right. That's very important in terms of their... Uh, you know, uh, again, the structure, I mean, uh, the infrastructure, the, where they are working, the facilities, and also the income, the salary part of it. Everything should be taken care of. At the same time, the quality of the teacher, the qualification, the right. required uh, proper TET, etc. Okay, should be taken care of. Only then the quality of education will improve. Only when the quality of teacher improves, quality of education will improve. Because students, Absolutely. it's a mixed uh, community, yes, uh, yes. so we'll have you know good average, uh, above average, and uh, slow learners, etc. In every school, in every class, and so if the teacher is good only, she can motivate everybody right from the topper till uh, you know that slow learner. Yes. So lot of importance is to be given to the teacher quality. That's my personal uh, opinion. No, no, there's no two ways about it. You need to definitely work on teachers. I keep. In fact, when I go to uh, colleges and schools, when I talk about, uh, you know, working with students, I, in fact, propose, let's work with the teachers first, right? And let's work with the faculty crowd first because they need, if I work with them, that's the 20% that will give me 80% of output. Rather than me going and working with students, I would love to work with teachers first. And I think that's a very, very important point that you're In some now. management colleges and private institutions, so the teachers are paid, the college professors, you know, they are paid, not professor, uh, the assistant professor, uh, they are paid, uh, you know, just 15,000, 20,000 and all that. So how do you expect right. them to work to their best? So, you know, government has to, you know, find ways and means, a solution for all these problems. And uh, only then they can expect quality in education. Simply, if you put it in words, it's not enough. You have to True. put it into practice and mm -hmm. you'll have to find the ways and means of achieving it. And uh, you know, there should be representatives to eradicate all these uh, you know, problems, the issues existing, the challenges which are existing in the education field. And only yes. then you can achieve what you want, actually. Only then we can call ourselves as giving a holistic education, this, that, and all that. I, I know until otherwise we solve all these uh, you know, minute problems, it's very difficult to implement what the government wants to implement. That's what I personally feel. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for, thank you for your wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Purnima, ma'am, please go ahead. Uh, please go and uh, share your thoughts. Okay, I think people are confused about feedback for parents. That's a feedback link that we used. I had to create a last minute feedback form. So please, uh, you know, don't mind the name, but it's for, uh, you know, just generic. Just go ahead and fill it. Please go ahead uh, with your question. 
anybody else would like to share your thoughts um uh tamil this is brinda here uh basically no uh, people from the uh, government or anyone who is working uh, you spoken for spoke upon point where uh, retired faculties will be coming back to the colleges similarly yeah. if retired people no working in metro water working in uh, highway department if they could come back and teach the students in the practical classes that would actually value add more because the uh, practical lab sections uh, the theory part of it and whereas i mean whatever we study in the lab there and when we get into the industry it is not the same and the teachers only study the same thing that's given in the practical books so if that could be imparted i think that would make a lot of difference also okay yeah you're right i mean i think the intention is to um, you know uh, bring those senior people retired people for those practical exposures only uh, i think uh, that's what the intention is um, but we'll have to see how it will get implemented uh, that that's the question that that's the billion dollar question that keeps popping up in my mind so we'll have to see uh, can i ask a question please sure ma'am yeah i uh, just want to know this uh, when they saying three languages i mean you mean to so say in tamil nadu they would be compulsory uh, they'll have to learn tamil as a medium of instruction till fifth standard that's what it's been recommended i don't see the thing is they are also saying that the state regional uh, governments can also take a call on that so nowhere uh, you know it is just like it's not very pushy right uh, the the these are again policies uh let's call it, let's understand a policy policy is not the law right policy is different from law law is something that everybody must follow policy is a guideline and um, when you are looking at a guideline uh, it is only telling you that we need to uh, you know we may follow these things and these are good recommendations um and and uh, if somebody what they are saying is if somebody learns uh, you know uh, a subject till fifth standard in in the mother tongue their cognitive ability is much better and we have seen we see multiple examples coming out uh, you know people who have studied in regional medium they are they are actually get, excelling in many fields so they are quoting that as an example but again it depends upon how parents want to see that and it, again uh, there's nothing like hard and fast not really pushed on people um, i think that's something that we have grossly misunderstood i think we have to understand that policy is like just a guideline it's like a barom you know something that we can evaluate ourselves against so i think did i answer your question asanthi or yeah yeah you did thank you okay so feedback form is not working is it okay i'm checking uh, let me teaching children in mother tongue sir till fifth standard mm -hmm. hello Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, it, it may not uh, help them much because learning English will be a problem uh, uh, when they go to higher class, and uh, terms okay. will be totally different. You know, uh, mother tongue in mother tongue and in English, the terms the, and teachers will find it very difficult to cope with both English right. and mother tongue. So that uh, you know, I don't understand how they are going to implement that. Um, See, I think uh, as I told you, right? Uh, it's again a guideline. The schools might want to handle it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, some schools might fall uh, in line with this policy. Some schools will go against it, right? But end of the day, what they are saying is a guideline. And uh, for us to really, you know, just measure where we are and where we should go, I think that's what ultimately uh, the the you know it, it, the the policy boils down to. So it may not be mandatory. Yeah, I mean, it, nowhere it is actually said that you have to follow this. Mm. Uh, it says that it's 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 something that you know it's good to do. It's 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 a recommendation. recommendation. It's a guideline. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So in a way, I think this one thing that's good has happened is uh, for first standard, the child has to be six years old. So I think that cognitive and all other parameters will work well if the child is completed six when they enters enter the. end of first standard right so that's actually very good yeah okay as a person uh, as a parent uh, with children who've gone through the 
GCSE curriculum. As you said, uh, this is uh, uh, trying to emulate the I GCSE curriculum, right? right. The Cambridge. Right. Uh, as a as a parent, I have had the option to have my children as part of it. This is our fee for everyone. So, uh, I think the curriculum for the primary level of education in GCSE is quite uh, elaborate from in 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 that Cambridge curriculum. And it gives a flexibility of learning concepts outside the purview of textbooks, which right. uh, which inculcates the habit of critical thinking mm. at a very young age. And I think that's the best part of what the policy talks about. And yes. uh, when critical thinking becomes part of your life very early, I think you grow up to be a person who questions status quo, which ensures that the society progresses rather than stagnate. And that is what impressed me about the education policy because when you start early to think in ways where you can question the status quo and bring about a change, that is something healthy for a progressive society. Absolutely, you're right. Okay. More importance can be given to practicals. Uh, we are giving importance in our curriculum. Uh, mostly, we are uh, giving importance for theory, especially in state board curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, school, I'm talking okay. about the school. So, uh, we are not uh, giving that much of importance for practicals. Only for the sake of conducting the practical exam, 10, 11, 12, we are having, yeah, of course, 9 standard. But right. it should be done right from the lower classes. And for every class, we should have a practical session so that uh, the theory along with the practical will give them better knowledge, better idea. And I think that's, uh, that's the intention that they have got. Uh, they, they want it to be more holistic and practical, more mm -hmm. experiential learning has been included. Yeah, very, very uh, important. In, involving them with uh, social projects. Yeah, otherwise well, understanding yeah. of the concepts won't happen, sir. Yeah. Uh, what I missed to add in that is uh, when when our children go through that kind of uh, 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 curriculum in the primary, as a parent who's done uh, an education in Indian system, I, I did my education in Indian system. I went through my own learning process of understanding how the status quo has to be questioned and why it is important for a child, for, for the bandwidth to be given to a child to learn in that environment. So even as a parent uh, who's gone through rote memory all my life, for me, it was a learning curve. And I think uh, the education policy, if, uh, as you say, it does not explain the process of how it can be implemented. There should be some amount of uh, uh, learning for the parents as well for us to uh, uh, accept the curriculum change. Yeah. So that is something which I went through when my children went through the uh, GCSE curriculum. Right. Okay. So uh, I think uh, I think we can close off this session. So thank you so much. Uh, I've also shared the uh, you know the Facebook group link. So those who want to be part of our community. We have a teacher community, future of teaching. So anybody who would like to, you know, participate, continue to be in touch with us. Um, we have upcoming program next week. Um, we are going to talk about predicting career success. Again, um, that will be uh, another very interesting session that you will see. Uh, we will share the details with you um, in the same mail. Uh, you will receive it on email. So do participate and uh, let's try and uh, make our best for the next uh, generation. So thank you so much. And uh, please leave your uh, final comments about what you felt, what you learned about the session, uh, learn from the session today so that I will know whether I have done a good job or not. So that'll be uh, very helpful. Thank you and um, nice connecting with you all.
Thank you. I'll be around for some time. If anybody wants to have a chat, um, I'll be here for a few more minutes. So those who can want to, um, you know, discuss, want to talk. Hello. Yeah. Hello.